Um, <laughs> this is one of the worst slots to talk at in any conference. You know, it's a three-day conference. You're all feeling a little bit sort of exhausted now. We're nearly towards the end. You're starting to lose focus. So I thought it might help you if I gave you my talk in one sentence. Um, this is the executive summary talk. Okay. What I'm, the, the key point I'm trying to get across in this, uh, in this short talk today is that Archaeology needs students, it needs all students um, to contribute in all sorts of ways to archaeology and archaeology in turn has an awful lot to give back to students, indeed everybody. Um, and, uh, CBA as you know, Council of British Archaeology, our sort of mission statement, archaeology for all, we believe that everybody has a, a, a role to play in archaeology, everybody can get something from archaeology, it's a subject we do in the public interest, um, that's the main sort of driver for why we're doing this work. Uh, it's not for commercial gain, uh, it's for public interest, um, and students are a key group, a key constituency within that, um, that, that range of audience. Um, one of the things I want to do is talk a little bit about some of the opportunities. Um, I feel like I should have sort of declare an interest uh, before I, I sort of get into the main talk, is that, yeah, I was actually a student once. Um, in your terms, it was probably the early Bronze Age, um, but uh, I went through the traditional route, and I think, it, I think it is important that you know how I got through that route, because I think it does colour my judgement to some extent, inevitably. Um, I was one of those rather lucky people that discovered, uh, while I was at school, uh, what I wanted to do, and I've been incredibly fortunate to be able to pursue it. Um, so I started my first dig was when I was 14. I volunteered with a, a local society who were digging at the weekends. Um, I often had days off school when there were um, emergency excavations to be undertaken because my teachers understood that actually for me and for my future that was probably more important than the, uh, the lesson I was going to learn that day, which I could always catch up on later. I worked for a local archaeological unit during my school holidays. I was on the committee of a local archaeological society. Um, I went and did the standard um, undergraduate archaeology degree, master's, um, doctorate. During that time, I got involved in a whole variety of national organisations. I was on the council of the IFA while I was doing my master's. Um, I was involved in a number of conferences. Back in those days, this is now I'm talking about the mid-1980s, there was a thing called the Young Archaeologists Conference, which was run every year by a different university um, by the students um, not just for students and for um, people in academia, but it brought together a range of, of effectively younger <coughs> archaeologists. And it was an opportunity for younger archaeologists to get together. And the, effectively the equivalent now um, is the IFA, uh, CIFA New Generation Group and their annual meetings. And I think those are really important opportunities for young people to get together um, and talk about your perspectives uh, on the, the contributions that you can make, because the context has changed. Um, and that's one of the things I'm very conscious of, is that my background and my um, sort of perspective on things is coloured by the, the route that I came through, which I've just sort of very briefly outlined. But I know that things have changed, and I know think one of the most crucial changes is the introduction of fees uh, for undergraduate students, particularly, and the, the significance that that has for what you can do while you're spending your time as students. Um, the other thing, though, that I think is really important in terms of, of, of just sort of contextualising this a little bit is that the student body is incredibly diverse. And, you know, we, we're just sort of labelling students as a, as, a, as a block here, really. But I'm very conscious that, you're, you know, you're talking about single honours students, joint honours students, combined honours students. You've got those that go down a, an art stream, those go down more predominantly a science stream. Um, you've got students that switch. Um, we start off coming to university thinking maybe they're interested in history, they switch halfway through their first year or their first term. You've obviously got undergraduates, postgraduates. It's a very diverse group of people with different interests, different perspectives. But again, the point I, I really want to emphasise is that I think for all those people, um, even if they have no interest whatsoever and never did have in becoming an archaeological professional, archaeology still has a lot to offer them and they still have a lot to offer archaeology. Just thinking a little bit about some of the things that, um, that you can do while you're a student, and again, the, I'm talking about these as, uh, in that context, but many of these things are available to everybody. They're ways to engage with archaeology, and they're areas of archaeology that need participation, they need engagement, particularly from younger people, um, and they bring and give an awful lot as a consequence. One of the things, for example, that young archaeology um, it, it needs, it needs more people that are prepared to run branches, active branches, of the archaeologist club. Uh, CBA runs the, these branches, supports the branches, 
uh, for 8 to 16-year-olds, but they're all run by volunteers. We've got 70 branches at the moment across the UK. There's huge demand um, from young people to go to these branches. They provide a sustained opportunity to engage in all sorts of interesting aspects of archaeology over you know, many years and can be really formative uh, in terms of developing people. Um, not, again, not necessarily thinking that they have to go and be professional archaeologists, but you know, for all sorts of life skills um, that they bring. Those are fantastic opportunities for students and younger people to get involved. Um, training is provided. You know, we, we CBA provides training. We get the leaders together. We pay for travel expenses to those meetings. There's health and safety training, child protection training, archaeological training. Lots of opportunities which will uh, provide you with experience that will be stand you in good stead no matter where you want to go in the future. Local societies, community archaeology groups, CBA regional groups in England, and some of the other national partners that we work with, the one thing that they always say when I go around and talk to them is we want more young people to be involved in our work. Um, if you go to a, a local archaeological society gathering, a, a talk that they do, um, the one thing that they always say is we're frustrated that we can't get in touch with younger people and we want more younger people involved in what we do. Um, the sort of reverse perspective often is um, you say, suggest to people, well, why don't you go along to some of these meetings? Um, and uh, somebody, you know, 20 year old goes along to the meetings, they turn up and they say, oh, this isn't for us. You know, it's full of people who are, who are talking about things and uh, have a rather different perspective on life. There's nobody like me there. Um, so again, we need more people to engage in those places. There are lots of opportunities, lots of societies, lots of ways, and, and you know, many of these societies that have active fieldwork programs. They are places you can get uh, practical experience, not just in the, the field um, excavation side, in the post-excavation side, in working in archives. Lots of different aspects of archaeology um, are delivered through local societies, community archaeology groups. Those are all places where you have opportunities to develop skills and experience. Archaeology also needs advocates. Um, it needs people to stand up and speak on behalf of archaeology, not just in relation to site-specific issues like um, you know, a planning application that might be threatening a, uh, a well-known Shropshire hill fort, um, but increasingly across the country we need people to talk to local councillors, to local authority heritage champions, uh, anybody who'll listen, frankly, um, to say why we, the public, all value archaeology. Um, we could be in for a very tough time in the next five years. Um, you know, it, the whole conversation we're just having about commercial archaeology could become an irrelevance um, in the next few years if the government decides, with almost the stroke of a pen, that the, the, the country needs more housing. Therefore, uh, we need to remove blockers to more houses being built. And the perception, not the reality, I don't think, but the perception is that taking archaeology out of the planning process will remove one of those blockers and it will suddenly lead to houses being created for all of our people. Um, I don't think anybody who, who looked at that believes that that actually would deliver um, a lot more affordable housing in particular in those ways, but you can well envisage it happening. And if that happens, um, and even if it doesn't, the worry is that local authority cuts will mean that people are not in the position to put um, conditions on planning applications and advise local planning authorities in the same way. A lot of the commercial work that we see at the moment, that may not be the opportunity that's there over the next few years. So we need people across the country to be standing up, working with local groups, look, being parts of local communities, saying we value these services, we think archaeology is important. All of you have a potential role in that. And all of you, you know, archaeology needs all of you to be engaged um, in those activities. Some of these are individual activities, some of these are, uh, are organisational activities. I'd like to see um, the opportunity for university archaeology societies, for example, not just focusing on, uh, on trips for members and on talks, but getting involved in local archaeology, getting involved with the local archaeological society, getting involved in local archaeological advocacy um, as needed. So there are plenty of opportunities, despite the challenging um, situation that we face. There are ways in which you can engage with the archaeological um, discipline, um, I tend to use the word discipline rather than profession uh, because archaeology for all, I think, is, is, is a different, slight, subtly different message, not to say that professional standards aren't important. You can join CIFA and CBA for a combined fee, special offer, £30. Um, 
if you go to the CBA website, I, I'm not sure if you can do it through the CIFA website, but if you go to the CBA website, you can join both organisations over the next couple of days. If you phone up our office and uh, uh, say that you're at the TAG conference, £30 special offer deal. There are lots of issues about expectations, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm concerned, and I'm interested to hear from you in the, in the discussion in a, in a little while about this issue, about whether you feel as students that you can take advantage of many of these opportunities that exist, given the, the heavy work programme that you have, the need to, to pay your, you know, the need to earn money in many cases, which perhaps removes the opportunities, the time opportunities that were there, uh, certainly when I was an undergraduate. There are enormous opportunities to get involved in archaeology. It's frustrating, this boom and bust um, scenario, uh, where you know, a couple of years ago there were no jobs in archaeology, now we're actually we don't think we've got enough archaeologists. We're thinking, well, if HS2 comes along, how on earth will we actually have enough archaeologists to do all the work that's going to go with that? But the frustration is if we train up lots more people, we get them involved, three years down the line, we might be into, room, into bust again, that we're not providing sustainable jobs for those people. So there are challenges there. There's no, no getting away from it. But archaeology provides a sustained, life-changing, lifelong opportunity. Um, and you all have an opportunity to do that, even if you have no um, uh, interest in going off and actually working in archaeology. So it's a two-way street. You have individual responsibility, just as we were talking about before the session. The world's your oyster, it seems to me. You've got all the opportunity in the world, but it's a two-way street. Archaeology needs you. It needs your participation. It needs your advocacy. It needs your support. And archaeology will give you an awful lot back. Simple message. Thank you. Um, I've just done my master's outside of archaeology um, and I have been members of the CBA and CIFA as well, IFA for student members and I've got very much involved. However, the masters I was in, they had surveying societies, civil engineering societies and these were also chartered groups. <coughs> as a student they were free to join and they had a lot more people partaking in activities because there was that aspect of what was free. So students were more willing to go, they were more willing to maybe even just pay for a little bit of their own transport rather than have that funded. But the initial outlay was free so they were, had that more encouragement to do so. I think that's why, from, to my mind, one of the real opportunities is to get involved with local archaeological societies, local community groups, because that, they're not paid training excavations. Um, you know, they're not exclusive in that sense. They are opportunities which may well be on your doorstep, so travel may not be that, uh, that, that much of an issue. Um, and again, they often need the skills and the, the, uh, the, the, the knowledge that students can bring to help them with that underpinning knowledge and understanding that often goes with the, the field experience that you have to have. It's, you know, again, you need, you need both. So I think that's why, to me, to my mind, that area um, is an opportunity, yeah. not, not, a, not a threat in that way. Um, but of course, the, one of the challenges for us is we are quite a small discipline, um, and we don't therefore necessarily have the funding that comes in through some of the other channels yeah. that some of those other, dis uh, other professions have. Um, and we're trying to build this up from, from the ground a little bit at the moment. Um, I think it's, it's pretty clear that uh, developing careers in archaeology, in any part of archaeology, it's almost always necessary to have quite a lot of, it, of volunteering experience and, and of time. And this is, this is something that, that I talk to, to my students a lot, of, a lot about. Uh, undergraduates and masters, take every opportunity you can to volunteer in museums, in any part of the heritage, the heritage profession as a whole. And as a university, we provide opportunities. My concern is how exclusionary that is, because a lot of, a lot of my students are working part-time. Some of them are working almost full-time hours. They are being massively disadvantaged. And I'm worried that this structure, and it's the way it is, it's the way it's probably always going to be, is wringing out any sh tiny shreds of diversity that might have survived in archaeology. Um, and I'm not sure what we can do about that, because that's a serious problem. Mm. No, I, I absolutely share that concern, as I, as I alluded to in my talk, really. I'm interested to know what, what people think about that, because uh, th that is different, clearly, in the last few years. There is a danger that it becomes an exclusive, a more exclusive discipline. We've already seen from Doug's statistics that we're, we're not strong on diversity in some ways, um, and uh, it's an issue that we have to think hard about. Uh, it does, I think, you know, Robin's point earlier on, and, and as others have said, is that if you really commit it and you really want um, to get involved in archaeology or indeed any other walk of life, frankly, um, you, know, you, you can um, and you will, but you've got to stick at it. Um, and sometimes that's hard for people because they have an economic context in which they actually um, they de it deprives them of the opportunities um, to actually gain the experience which will get them on the, on the treadmill. Absolutely, but then have we got some responsibility to try and change those underlying s structures? Those that you've got any power in this, because that's 
that's just going to reinforce the problem and make it worse unless we make some major structural changes. Sure. Um, I just wanted to bring up, it's maybe a point that leads to a question, the fact that we're having this discussion, and we have this discussion in other venues and that as well, but the vast majority of us in this room are not representative of the vast majority of students that we are discussing. And so by the fact that we're, ha we're having this conversation in what I would consider to be an exclusive academic conference where undergraduate students are not encouraged to come and participate in a debate about their potential future um, is already pro problematic. And, and that comes back to the structures of we're trying to say to these students that we want to listen to you except for none of them are here. I mean, I, yeah, that, that, that I agree with you. And that, that's why I think you know, one of the things I was saying is that, I mean, I, I don't really know what the exact figures are. And clearly some of the samples we've heard about so far have been a little bit um, sort of tipped in one direction. It's one of the figures that was given last week at the CIFA launch was that 90% of undergraduates who go in and study archaeology have no intention of going into archaeology as, as a profession. Um, and of course that colours to some extent um, the, 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 the courses that are put on, the way that they're taught, um, the coverage, the, the, the syllabus, etc. Um, but those people, and the point I was trying to make really, is that those, those individuals still have a lot to contribute to archaeology. And archaeology has something to offer them in, in their lives then and in their later lives. Um, but we need to listen to them, we need to hear their voices, and we need to talk to them. Um, and maybe this, these aren't the right places for that. Um, that's why I think you know, actually going and talking and, and getting the young people together themselves um, in their institutions is maybe the right way to start to build a, a better picture. Tom, do you have a question? <coughs> it was more of an addendum just briefly to that, say that next year, as, as it has been the last two years, the annual Students Archaeology Conference is happening in, in, in Edinburgh. We've reading last year in New York, year before. I wonder how many people in this room actually are undergraduates? <laughs> two. <laughs> two people. Um, that is, I'm just want to sort of support your point, this is a very exclusive zone where we're not representative of the, the body we're discussing. And that's a major issue. And to be honest, the um, Annual Students Archaeology Conference is a tiny, tiny insignificant step towards trying to address that in terms of the major problem. There need to be, for a major conference like this, there need to be stipends for students to come and I mean, be encouraged to come because this is a, it just, you know, it's meek, unfortunately, that there are no more here. That's two out of 29, by the way, just so you know. So, do you have a question or a point? Oh, I was just going to pick up on something that Mike said, and I do think we do need to realize that the world is kind of rough at, the, at this moment. We just went through, like, a recession. They call it the Great Recession, which is pretty much a depression. We haven't had anything like this in 70 years. I mean, we didn't have the bread lines, thank God. But it was really bad, and it's really bad everywhere. I, I have friends who are, you know, went to go be lawyers because they thought that there'd be lots of money, and they're unemployed because they can't get enough jobs. They can't get jobs because there's too many people with, you know, lawyer qualifications. So I, I know we're all talking about archaeology here, but we may want to keep in mind that this is a general trend Finding a job was crap for the last five years, no matter who you were. Um, a couple of exceptions to that, but that's just, you know, politicians and me being snide. Um, but yes, I mean, this is a huge issue, and like I think we should deal with it, but we got to realize this might be an issue that is society-wide, um, issues with volunteering and having enough experience. I mean, we're all sort of insulated through archaeology, but go and talk to like a biology student or, you know, an art student who... For, for almost all time, have realized they're not going to have really great job opportunities in art. Um, it's not just us. A lot of people are in trouble as well. It, I think that that's a really important point. Um, um, I was, last night, it seems like a long time ago, perhaps it's only last night, um, I was speaking at a, an event at the British Academy in London about heritage crime. Um, and we were talking a bit about what I would term knowledge theft um, in relation to um, illegal metal detecting um, and about some of the damage that does to some of our sites. And somebody, the next speaker, was talking about it in an international context. And they were raising the situation in countries in Africa, in particular like Mali, um, where the only way um, to feed your family is to loot archaeological sites um, and sell for a meagre, meagre amount of money um, what you might find. Um, and in places like that where, you know, if there is a museum and there's a museum curator, they have to be, often be hidden um, because they'll be killed if they're known that they're the museum curator. Um, and, you know, we, we're, we are all archaeologists, but we're all citizens of the world too. Uh, and we have an ethical responsibility, I think, and on an individual level to do that. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on to the next presentation because I do realise...